Welcome everyone, good morning. Uh, thank you for joining us for uh, the second celebration of uh, Associate Professors event uh, this semester, this fall semester. We have a lot of events that we organize from the college, right? Seemingly every day there's an email about some event, but honestly this one is amongst the most heartwarming ones that we organize here uh, because what we intend to do here is A, celebrate the success of a recently promoted Associate Professors. Uh, those who have been through, um, you know, that, uh, that stretch of career know how difficult it was. Perhaps some of us who have been through it have forgotten about it. <laughs> but those who are in the process of going through it, or those who hope to go through it in the future, uh, can learn a lot from some of the uh, key insights of uh, decisions that these uh, colleagues have taken what made them successful, et cetera. So that's the second part of what we try to do here, uh, is to uh, share the wisdom uh, from that experience. Uh, a third part is to try and get new collaborations. There are many faculty colleagues, uh, and i also like to welcome all those who are joining us um, virtually today. Thank you for joining us. Uh, but this is an opportunity for a wider cross-section of faculty to get to know about you and to know about your work. And in fact, we do know that some of these discussions lead to future research collaborations as well, so hope that also happens. So without further ado, uh, I'd like to uh, call upon Young Kim to introduce uh, our first speaker, Fang Huang, for the day. So please, Young. Okay. Uh, good morning, everyone. It is my great pleasure um, to introduce our rising star, uh, Professor Fang Huang. Professor Fang um, is currently a Riley Associate Professor of Biomedical Engineering at uh, Weldon School. Professor Fang received uh, his bachelor's degree in physics at the University of Science and Technology of China in 2004 at his very early age and his PhD in physics from the University of New Mexico in uh, 2011, and his dissertation is about uh, ERK1 um, dimerization modeling using fluorescence uh, correlation with uh, spectroscopy, and as well as a uh, single molecule super resolution method uh, he's studying. Then he went on to um, postdoctoral training in cell biology at Yale University. And then uh, P Professor Fang joined uh, Purdue Engineering in 2015. And he had a um, very interesting journey from physics, biology, and uh, finally um, in engineering. Uh, so I want to actually ask, like, you're a physicist, or you're an engineer, or you're a biologist, actually. I really want to know your identity. Uh, he received uh, numerous awards and recognitions. In particular, he received the um, DARPA Young Faculty Award and received approximately $10 million in funding, including four or five large NIH grants. He has, I think, a few more at this moment. Uh, his research focuses on the uh, creation of novel microscopy method, including hardware and as well as um, algorithms that enable single molecule and super resolution um, uh, imaging. And actually he is known as a professor in our unit, um, publishes only nature papers. <laughs> only nature papers, actually. Um, as a researcher, a uh, key aspect I truly respect um, is he's an excellent example of resilient uh, researcher. Um, one lesson actually, including me, uh, is that a bold and innovative mindset will uh, be paid off uh, if we are persistent. Um, I really hope that we can really cultivate this culture in our unit as well. Without uh, further ado, um, please join me in welcoming Professor Huang. Thank you so much. All right, thank you so much, Yang, for your introduction. It's, it's a, a pleasure for me to present uh, my journey, or the student's journey, actually, to achieve all the success I'm going to show you today. So, uh, my name is Fang. I'm an associate professor at Biomedical Engineering Department, and my lab works on high-resolution optical imaging technologies to reveal biological structure that is unresolvable uh, using conventional methods. 
So for example, if you look at this picture of a confocal nuclear pore complex proteins on COD7 cells, all of these dots are nuclear pores, individual clusters, you can say. We call it puncta. And in fact, that if you look at it in super resolution image, you can see the picture is much better resolved. And in fact, if you look at cross section or subsection of that, it is very apparent that high resolution in super resolution image give you much a clearer view uh, in terms of resolution as well as it, as it re reveals that not 98 epitope positions potentially form this 40 to 60 and nanometer uh, ring-like structure. So how do we solve that? And how do we uh, uh, get this high resolution image? The concept lies in to localize the individual isolated single molecule emitters precisely in their centers and, and, and reconstruct their centers into the super resolution image uh, on the right over here. As you can see, as more molecule being reconstructed, the higher resolution you can see, the better that are revealed such that these structures are, that are traditionally under diffraction limit can now be seen using super resolution technology. And this work is developed, this concept developed in 2006, won the Nobel Prize in 2014. Now as you can see, we probably can imagine now cell biology processes or dynamics can now be revealed in cells, tissues, and animals with as high a resolution as you want. And therefore, testing a biological hypothesis will be simply taking a photo or movie on the process you want to investigate with sufficient resolution. While this is not the case, at least yet, there's tremendous challenges that still exist before we can claim that. For example, taking this photo takes a very long time. You have to isolate individual molecules, therefore taking thousands or even a million images sometimes to construct one image. And this is very detrimental for live cell imaging where dynamics is what you're seeking. Single molecule emission patterns generate aberration and scattering, also corrupts the features that we want to see in tissues because light propagates in tissue constitutes at different speed. At the same time, if you want really high resolution, one to five nanometers, you really, novel, you really need novel instrumentation and conventional method to detect photons, such that photons encode much more information than the current methods. So my lab focused on three directions on these uh, front or challenges that before we can claim really a revolutionary technology to solve biological hypothesis. We want to put super resolution in live cells and we also want to transition them from cells to tissues to small animals. For example, over here in the middle, you can see amyloid beta fibrillar structure in mouse frontal cortex in brain slices. We also developed novel technologies such that we can encode more information per photon count. Even with 500 photon count, we want to achieve one to five nanometer precision in localizing their centers. Mike and Paul spearheaded in the direction of high precision localization of single molecules through tissues. Here they uh, developed adaptive optics and also developed PSF engineering technologies using uh, deformed mirrors really to um, move super resolution from cells to tissues. Here's a picture of amyloid beta fibrils in 30 micron mouse brain sections in Alzheimer's disease model. And you can see the drastic contrast between diffraction limited image and super resolution image, and for example, over here and here. And here's the other examples. Pei Yi and Sheng developed method. They decided to use deep learning to tackle single molecule analysis. Single molecules can have really complex patterns, for example, this one over on the bottom left. And these complex patterns can encode molecular information in multiple classes. It can encode the position of the molecule, orientation of the molecule, as well as the shared wavefront of the molecule. It is very difficult to decode them using traditional statistics and inference method. So they develop a deep neural network for a single molecule we call SMNet which are capable of inferring 3D location orientation and wavefront distortion simultaneously from a complex single molecule pattern. This network does not only extract the information, but extract the information at the statistical theoretical limit, which is demonstrated in these two figures. And here's a beautiful picture they reconstructed using their deep learning method showing the crispy structure of mitochondria membrane contour labeled by TOM20 proteins. Sheng and Yilun spearheaded in the high-speed acquisition. 
we want to use a high-speed camera to collect high-speed dynamics of cells. However, those cameras have caveats. Each individual pixel have different fluctuations. Therefore, if you want to look at the image, you're actually not only looking at the fluctuation of the biological signal, which is really what you want to get, you also have sensor fluctuations. And therefore, if you look at the picture in the middle on the red part, you can see all the dots over here showing the fluctuation of single pixels by themselves. It's not necessarily what we want to sense. So what they do is they combine the statistical knowledge and optic knowledge together and to separate the noise with the signal. Whereas the OTF boundary sets a boundary between signal and noise contribution towards noise-only contribution. Therefore, they can minimize the noise without affecting the signal. So on the bottom, you can see each individual pixel give you <coughs> fluctuations that we want to eliminate. And after their algorithm, noise correction algorithm, or NCS for short, you can see the contribution from pixel sensor noise is already gone. And you do not have any effect on your signal. And Elon actually further calculated the lower bound by statistics and also the constraint of OTF over here and demonstrate that the NCS actually performed uh, very close to the lower bound of the statistics. Shah and Fernand actually go ahead and invent another very unconventional microscope. Instead of looking at the horizontal plane of the specimen, which you usually put the specimen in there and you look at the horizontal plane. But this microscope looks at the vertical plane directly without scanning. So this allows you to image up to 20 micron depths with one shot without scan. And over here, you can see a drastic difference between a diffraction limited image and the super resolution image over here. And here's also NAP98, NAP98 uh, labeled with Alexa C47. And here's a super resolution image. Here's a contrast diffraction limited and super resolution diffraction limited and super resolution image. This is a very new setup, and both of them worked very hard to achieve this. Fan and Donghan, furthermore, are trying to tackle one of the long-standing problems in single molecule imaging. As you know that our business depends on localizing centers of the molecule. However, those centers of molecule, what model you use to model it? We take a bead image on the cover slip, and these are never accurate. You're trying to image in the tissues, the tissue photons experience tissue structures, while the bead <coughs> never experiences those. So what we are using is the in vitro model, and Fan and Donghan developed this method called the in situ PSF retrieval, directly retrieve the point spread function from single molecule blinking data. And therefore, they can use their algorithm to accurately localize single molecules in spite of aberration introduced by tissues. Here's a picture of diffraction limited amyloid beta fibrils in 30 micron brain sections. And you can see the wonderful reconstruction of high resolution image that you can trace the three dimensional fibril uh, in a very high accurate manner. And Don Han and Mayam now move forward to trying to get the system into a much higher resolution and depth. Hao Zheng and Sheng and Fan and Vemera take the lead on tackling one of the most difficult microscopy systems in the field for pi single molecule imaging system. Where we're trying to image the sample, the sample is sandwiched between two cover slips. You have two objectives coherently detecting the fluorescence emitted by every single molecule. By coherently combining them together, you form a single molecule interference pattern that generates modulations that give you enormous improvement in the axial resolution of the system upon the super resolution system I already told you. So about five to seven times uh, expected. As you can see, here's our initial result that Fan and Hao Zheng already demonstrated the possibility doing for pi single molecule imaging through tissue specimens. Most recently, Pei developed a new method leveraging her previous invention on single molecule neural network to use a network controlling a default mirror, a device that can optimize your microscope's penetration depths and the resolution. So as you can see over here, you have a fairly blurred image of single molecules. Every single molecule is a little bit distorted. Now we're going to perform deep learning driven adaptive optics. After even one cycle of compensation, you can see the aberration being drastically compensated. And over time, you can see the compensation result in a PSF module, PSF response that as if it never went through the specimen. 
And we have Yue Zheng over here, which is our organic chemist, developed uh, organic dyes for live cell imaging. Medi is uh, our uh, ER expert, is our link to uh, uh, diabetes. Li Fang already generated uh, tremendous insight for our understanding on how aberration affect resolution and how we aberrations affect how we correct the aberrations, which is a very interesting topic. And Cheng is our cell biologist and an expert on single molecule dynamic analysis. And their work is ongoing, I hope to uh, uh, share with you in the future. All of that is not possible without support for my mentors, collaborators, our heads, and our uh, colleagues. So we would like to thank David for his support and advocate for our research and also collaboration. And Dave Kish, who helped us uh, every single time, almost uh, within two hours, four hours, on uh, our need in research. Eugenio, who actually taught us what is deep learning after all. And Malba and Charlie to help us to uh, recruit me to here to Purdue, which is a wonderful place and the best decision in my life, probably, uh, other than my marriage, <laughs> <laughs> have to say. Um, and he also, they also helped me a lot on initial grant applications and also research ideas. Keenan Park for continuous support and advocate for our research and nominate me for multiple awards. Richard and Rams and for their help during a very difficult time in 2019 for the lab. Alex Chong Li, Daniel and Gary for being a wonderful collaborator. We look forward to working with you further to advance uh, technologies as well as to probably uh, solve questions. And George for their support. And would like to thank Keith Leakey and York Beavers of my uh, PhD and postdoc mentors, and also uh, Tom Pollard, who we have been working with for more than 10 years, and we're still learning how to do research from him. And uh, thank you very much. for the uh, wonderful overview of your research. Um, I think it's a time uh, for questions or comments. Yeah. We do have questions There's from Jen the zoo. Um, so, um, anyone uh, participating on um, the Zoom, I think you can uh, type in uh, your questions so that we can read. I have two questions um, sure. while we're waiting. So number one is more technical question, and number two is like a general in life. Um, so number one is, do you have any kind of um, target objective that the uh, resolution, that the best resolution you want to achieve with optical microscopy? I think, what's the best resolution so far you have? Like, well, 10 nanometers, 5 nanometers, I don't know, it depends on the depth and et cetera. But that is true. So uh, uh, there's two directions in the lab, as I mentioned, potentially deeper into the specimen. But the deeper you go, the worse resolution you will definitely get. And we want to mitigate that. Deformed mirror is one of the ways to do that, adaptive optics. Another way is potential advanced illumination technologies. We are also working on in the other direction of high resolution. And in terms of exact resolution, I will be comfortable from one to five or one to three nanometers. That will be our goal. Certainly, we have not achieved it. And we also are investigating possibility to find those structures in biology such that we can really take advantage of that resolution to reveal re new processes or dynamics. So uh, it's ongoing and it's evolving all the time, I would say. Wow, yeah. So one to three nanometers uh, using optical. Microsoft. Today, I will say, yes. Wow, wow, that's uh, impressive. Yes? Oh, yeah, and the second one actually is that, um, are you a physicist? Which title you're most <laughs> proud of? Physicist, biologist, or engineer? I, I, I'm a trained physicist, okay? But a lot of my work requires a lot of engineering, which I really enjoy. And I also enjoy working with biologists to solve biological questions. 
one of my dream course to teach is cell biology. If I can teach that course, <laughs> can I call myself biologist? <laughs> so I, I really, I, as you can see in the lab, we have chemistry in the lab. We have cell biologists in the lab. We have physicists, engineers, all these disciplines. And uh, that's all I can say. <laughs> Yes, I do. Okay, sure. Uh, Jan Alabach asks, how do you get ground truth information for your deep learning based methods? That's a very interesting question. So um, for single molecules, many of our ground truths can come in from a fiducial marker. That will be a bead on the cover slip. We can potentially localize. And we have very high precision stages like one to three nanometer or 0.3 nanometer resolution. So we can move the stage and see whether our deep learning give the exact result. But do we have ground truths in biology? We don't. The only thing we can validate is we can, know, we can image some known biology structures and see whether these structures look like they are supposed to be, for example, in an electron microscope when it's uh, shallow or depth. The two questions, Fang. Sure. Oh, by the way, congratulations. I, I, I love uh, the results every time I see them. But um, you spoke of two important decisions, right? One is a uh, life partner. The other is you know coming to Purdue. Uh, what about decisions you've taken after that? Uh, what are some key decisions after you joined Purdue that helped guide you to this success? Can you share some thoughts on that? And maybe they're not as important as the first two, but they're still important for many others here. So I think the most uh, important decision is having what la who lab member joining the lab. And uh, I've been very lucky to have very productive and um, lab members that are uh, work together with the whole team and they collaborate. And different people have different mentality, but they all willing to work together and contribute to the knowledge growth of the entire lab. I think that's probably the number one uh, careful thing that I'm trying to let whom join the lab, and uh, um, and the other decision would be uh, collaborations. And uh, single molecule is not an easy technology to implement, and usually it's not like confocal. And uh, collaborations is extremely important, and our collaborator so far has been very persistent in using our technology and optimizing the manner. Every single picture that I showed you is not within obtainable within three months. It's always like almost half a year or year optimization before you can see the picture over here. But during the process, student and postdoc learn a lot. Our contribution actually synergized together and we produce something that is difficult to produce on the first shot, which is actually a very rewarding experience. And again, maybe going to Kinam's, uh, not, well, Kinam is not online here. Is he online? No, he's, he's okay. Online. Yeah, no, the, but um, what, the, what, what would be the um, grand challenge problem in biophysics or in biochemistry that some of these techniques will be able to unlock? Very interesting question. Um, um, the technology we're trying to pursue has a broad application uh, areas, I would say. And in terms of which question is more important than the others, I will let the biologists consider. <laughs> yeah, very interesting talk. So I enjoyed it. <clears throat> For those are fantastic final images. Uh, you take a lot of time uh, to get from very initially very blurred uh, original data. Uh, but to trust, put trust on the final pr optimized uh, image, is there a standard case that you can calibrate your process that the one you obtain finally actually is the physical image mm -hmm. rather than numerical artifacts? Yes. So um, it, it's important to calibrate all these methods, and we have a different methods to calibrate. We have DNA origami that we can manufacture. And uh, well, in the end, you still don't know what's the size of DNA origami, and, and uh, it varies from, from different particle to particle. But at least they give you an average effect of how much you are expecting 
on average about two sites, for example, 50 nanometers. And uh, we also have model system used in, and typically use single molecule imaging. And we have a, a biological system called nuclear pore complex systems that I showed you in the beginning. But there's another uh, subunit that you can label, that which has very well measured uh, EM uh, units. So they know the copy number as well as the distance between those. And we were these are developed by EMBL, a wonderful technology that we can use to calibrate. And these are very important and uh, uh, calibration method we use. Yes. Thank you. I'll have a last question, actually. Um, so I know you're at the uh, forefront of highly, highly competitive, this optical microscopy community. And how do you kind of manage your stress or do you have any secret to um, kind of um, to be successful in this highly competitive um, scientific community? First of all, I, I cannot say myself successful. But looking at all these pictures, I can say our project Many of them are successful. So how do we achieve that? And uh, we have students, and we also have a, a, a study conversation, the journal clubs that we often hold and on a weekly basis. We meet every two, uh, two twice every week to dis dissect all the important uh, uh, papers in the field. And during that time, we um, dive pretty deep into that. And overall, I think the field also has many, many publications and we can cluster them into different knowledge bases and therefore evolve and the knowledge also evolve in students and postdocs so that they have gradually, not very fast, but gradually they have a cohesive understanding of how, why this thing goes certain direction, why this thing goes not. Therefore, it's effectively reduced the number of readings or number of uh, careful studies we have to perform because, as you said, there's many publications on this field and we have to filter through this. Great, thank you so much, and um, congratulations again. And I hope to, um, and looking forward to um, seeing you more uh, progress and uh, more nice images. All right, thank you. Thank you so much.